This is your daily Facts Matter update, and I'm your host, Roman, from the Epic Times. And now let's begin today's discussion by talking about natural immunity. And actually, I'd like to preface this segment by mentioning that on this program, we have already, on many, many, many different occasions, talked about studies which demonstrate the effectiveness of natural immunity. And in fact, there is already a fairly large body of science surrounding it that at this point, it almost feels like it's beating a dead horse to discuss it further. However, I don't necessarily believe that that's the case because you have places in this country like Boston, Los Angeles, and New York City, which continue to mandate vaccinations and completely ignore natural immunity. They do not offer any caveats to people who already have natural antibodies. In fact, just two days ago, right here in New York City, the new mayor fired nearly 1,500 employees because they were not vaccinated, including many teachers. And then likewise, LA County, their sheriff's department is looking at the prospect of losing about 4,000 employees over their vaccine mandate. And frankly, Los Angeles cannot stand to lose any cops right now. And so with these realities still playing themselves out in this country, I think it is still incredibly important to inform you of as many new studies as possible that relate to natural immunity. And along that line, there are two new studies that I believe are worth discussing in regards to how natural immunity protects against both COVID infection as well as COVID hospitalization. So the first study, it came from researchers over at the Cleveland Clinic, and they found that the protection that a person develops from a prior COVID infection, meaning that they have natural immunity, well, it protects them very well against the Omicron variant. Now, it is worth mentioning that their study has yet to be peer-reviewed, but if you'd like to read the preprint version of it for yourself, you can find it over on the MedRx website. The link will, of course, be in the description box below this video if you want to check out the study for yourself. And so what the researchers here did was that they looked at the employees who work over at the Cleveland Clinic and who have been working there for at least the last 14 months, meaning that all the employees they were looking at, they have been working there since at least December the 16th of 2020. And you might think, well, that's not a lot of people. However, the Cleveland Clinic is huge. And so in total, they were looking at the records of an astonishing 39,766 employees. And by the way, just as an aside, that is not a typo. I used to live in Cleveland, and the Cleveland Clinic is just really that big. It has that many employees. In fact, the Cleveland Clinic itself is so big that it has its own zip code within the downtown Cleveland area. Regardless, though, getting back to the study here, what the researchers did was once they took this data of these employees, they put them into different categories depending on their vaccination and natural immunity statuses. And what they found was that even without vaccination, having the natural antibodies from a prior infection, well, that proved to be very effective at protecting the individual from a future COVID infection. Here's, in fact, how the lead researcher explained his findings of the study. Quote, During the time when the Omicron variant was the predominant strain causing infection, prior COVID-19 provided effective protection against infection for at least six months, even in the absence of vaccination. Now, as he mentioned, when the researchers were looking at the data chronologically, meaning when they stratified the cases by time, they found that natural immunity appeared to wane at about the six-month mark following the prior infection. And so for the first six months, the employees appeared to be very well protected but then those same employees became more likely to be tested and positive for COVID after the six-month mark. However, the researchers found that if the naturally immune individual received a single dose of the vaccine, then their protection would last longer. Here's in fact what they wrote, quote, boosting with a COVID-19 vaccine designed for an earlier variant was associated with significantly reduced risk of infection with the Omicron variant in multivariable analyses, specifically among people previously vaccinated or previously infected for whom it was more than six months past their prior infection or vaccination. However, here's where things get a little, you can say, curious. Because the researchers also found that if the naturally immune individual got two doses of the vaccine instead of just one dose, well, then their chances of actually getting the virus again increased. Here's specifically what they wrote, quote, among those with natural immunity, receiving two doses compared to one dose of vaccine was associated with higher risk of COVID-19, which is curious. However, the scientists mentioned that they were unsure as to why this was the case, and they suggested that other scientists should look into it. Regardless, though, their conclusion is that natural immunity should be considered as effective as a two-dose regimen of the vaccine and therefore should be acknowledged by the broader society. Here's specifically what they wrote as a part of their conclusion, quote, effectively, prior infection should be considered at least as protective in protecting against future infection as two doses of an mRNA vaccine. This is not to say that it is better to get infected than to get vaccinated. However, if someone did get infected and survived, then the protection they have acquired from natural infection should be acknowledged. Perhaps someone should share this study with uh, the politicians over in Boston, New York, Los Angeles, and most importantly, in Canada. Regardless, though, that was all from the Cleveland Clinic study. The second study that I believe is really worth highlighting was just published last week over in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it came from researchers over in Qatar. 
And likewise, they found that natural immunity equipped people well against severe disease from the Omicron variant. Specifically, the researchers here found that people with natural antibodies, they had approximately 88% protection against severe, critical, or fatal COVID disease that was caused by the Omicron variant. Think about that, 88%. That led the researchers in the study to write this, quote, the protection of previous infection against hospitalization or death caused by reinfection appeared to be robust regardless of the variant. Now, these Qatari researchers, who just for your reference, they were being funded by the Qatar Ministry of Public Health, Whale Cornell Medicine, as well as several other institutions, what they did was that they studied the data from their own national databases, which contained all of the country's information about things like COVID cases, infection rates, vaccination data, fatalities, et cetera. Their databases are quite robust. And so what they found was that in regards to severe, critical, or even fatal COVID cases, here's how the level of protection broke down, broke down by variant for people who specifically were naturally immune. In cases caused by Omicron, naturally immune people had approximately 88% protection against severe or fatal cases. For the Delta variant, naturally immune people had 100% protection against severe or fatal cases. For the previous Beta variant, the protection was also around 88%. And for the initial Alpha variant, the protection was around 69%. And so that data that we just looked at was specifically in regard to severe cases. However, looking at overall infection rates, here's what the researchers found. And again, all that is data we're about to look at is for those who are naturally immune. Against the alpha, beta, and delta strains, natural immunity protection was hovering at around 90%, give or take. However, against Omicron, it offered a 56% protection rate, meaning that the level of protection decreased precipitously for the Omicron variant. And so if you were naturally immune, you were only 56% protected from Omicron. However, what's interesting to note is that that Omicron number, it actually included people who had both natural immunity as well as who were vaccinated, meaning they had both. And so when the researchers actually went in and excluded the people who also got the vaccine, meaning when they only looked at the people who had exclusively natural antibodies, well, the level of protection actually rose from 56% to 62% against Omicron, which is frankly a little bit surprising, but it does actually seem to be in line with the other study that we discussed a moment ago, the one from the Cleveland Clinic that found that people who had, for some reason, both the natural antibodies as well as a two-dose regimen of the vaccine actually, for some reason, had a higher incidence of getting the Omicron variant. As to why that is, I'm not sure. However, here is what the, um, the researchers in the study actually wrote, quote, protection of natural immunity is robust against reinfection with alpha, beta, and delta variants at about 90%, but less so against Omicron at approximately 60%. Still, this shows that the natural immunity was relatively strong against reinfection with Omicron. And so it is worth noting that the conclusions of this new study from Qatar, as well as, of course, that other study from the Cleveland Clinic, they both fall in line with the conclusions of many, many other studies that have been conducted around the world, which have found that natural immunity not only exists, but is also rather robust. In fact, over at the Brownstone Institute website, you can find a compilation of all the studies regarding natural immunity. And at this moment, there are over 140 of them. Perhaps somebody should tell the politicians that are still not offering any caveats to people who have natural antibodies. If you'd like to read either this Qatari study or this uh, Cleveland st Clinic study for yourself, I'll throw the links to all of them into the description box below this video for you to check out. And all I ask in return is that you take a super quick moment to smash, smash, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And now, before we move on over and discuss how the U.S. is currently facing major shortages of 117 different medications, I'd like to take a super quick moment and introduce the sponsor of today's episode. That's right. Our sponsor for today's episode is a phenomenal organization that not only advocates for conservative values, but also provides awesome membership benefits to over 2 million people across the entire country. I am, of course, talking about AMAC or the Association for Mature American Citizens. Now, they are quite literally one of the fastest growing conservative organizations in all of America, especially for those aged 50 and up. Although, frankly, you don't have to be over the age of 50 to join. You can be any age. And if you do join AMAC, you will get phenomenal benefits such as money saving benefits, uh, access to cutting edge news. And in fact, they will actually send you a bi-monthly magazine directly to your mailbox, which is quite honestly awesome. I love AMAC's magazine. However, besides all the money saving benefits, a lot of people said that they joined AMAC because of the fact that they fight on Capitol Hill for conservative values. Here's in fact what they wrote. As a socialist storm is brewing, if you care about the future of America, like the two million members of AMAC, then you should join as well. And you can do so over at amac.us forward slash facts matter. That's amac.us forward slash facts matter. Go on there, join the organization. It doesn't cost that much. However, the membership benefits are great and the cause is even greater. Again, that's amag.us forward slash facts matter. And now let's head back to the studio.
And now let's move on over and talk about medications. Or more specifically, how at this very moment, the U.S. is facing shortages of over 117 different pharmaceutical drugs. Now, that article that you just saw up on your screen, the one that we highlighted, it said that it was 114 drugs. But that article was published last month, in January, and things have not gotten much better. So in order to get the updated numbers, I went over to the FDA's drug shortage list website for myself. You can do so too. You can find it online. It's publicly available. And as you can see there, they have 165 entries in total. However, 48 of them have been resolved, which leaves 117 drugs that are still in shortage. And these include things like antibiotics, diuretics, drugs for high blood pressure, heart failure medications, and so on. Some of these are things that people really need in order to live, and now we are running short of them. So the obvious question then is why? Why exactly is America, which is of course a first world nation, suddenly experiencing shortages of so many medications? Well, the answer has to do with outsourcing. You might not know this because frankly, for one reason or another, the legacy media outlets in this country have largely ignored the story, but much of America's pharmaceutical drug production has been outsourced to China. So just like when you go over to Walmart and almost every product that you see on the shelf has those three beautiful words on it, made in China, well, it's the same story with our pharmaceuticals. In fact, according to a study that was conducted under President Trump by the Department of Commerce, it found that a staggering 97% of all antibiotics in the United States came from China. That fact, that study, it led President Trump's chief economic advisor at the time, Mr. Gary Cohn, to say this. If you're the Chinese and you want to really just destroy us, just stop sending us antibiotics. And frankly, it appears that he really has a point. Because think about that for a moment. China, the country that's currently being ruled by the Chinese Communist Party, and who is not shy in the least about their plans for world hegemony and taking down America, well, they now control the production of our medications. With a position like that, who even needs to fire missiles in order to win a war? They could, just as Mr. Cohn said, stop sending us medications and that would be it. And furthermore, it's not just antibiotics that the study mentioned. According to Ms. Rosemary Gibson, who, by the way, is the author of this phenomenal book right here called China Rx, we here in America no longer even have the capability to produce our own penicillin. Here's what she said during a recent interview. We can't make penicillin anymore. The last penicillin plant in the United States closed in 2004. If China shut the door on exports of medicines and their key ingredients and raw materials, U.S. hospitals and military hospitals and clinics would cease to function within months, if not days. Now, if you're thinking that that's just a hypothetical worry, well, that does not appear to be the case. Because the Chinese Communist Party, well, they seem to be fully aware of the situation and the great position that they find themselves in. In fact, during the trade war between China and the Trump administration that was happening just a few years ago, one of China's leading economists, he said this during a speech to their national congress. China is the world's largest exporter of vitamins and antibiotic raw materials. Once the export is reduced, the medical systems of some developed countries will not work. And to be frank, that is a phenomenal tool to have during negotiations. Because again, you can talk all you want about things like tariffs, trade deficits, and sovereign debt bonds all you want. But if the opposition literally controls the medicine of your population, well, how are you going to negotiate against that? And of course, this problem was identified long before the pandemic, but with the supply chain crunch that we are experiencing now, the medication shortage has become exacerbated just like shortages of everything else. And in terms of a solution, well, Ms. Gibson suggests that we stop playing around and bring production back home. Here's what she said. We have a lot of empty manufacturing facilities in the United States, and what it takes is refurbishing those with newer technology that can truly make medicines at up to 40% less cost. We just need the upfront investment. And it won't happen unless there is public support and public funding for that. Now, if you'd like to check out her phenomenal book, China Rx, and I would highly recommend that it lays out how we got to this point quite well, I'll throw the link to it into the description box below this video so you can check it out for yourself. And also, Ms. Gibson had a phenomenal interview over on Epic TV where she sat down with Yanni Kellick and she described exactly how the Chinese Communist Party came to control our medication production. Here's a trailer for that interview. This is what happens when we lose control over the supply of something as important as medicine. We lose control over quality. We see during coronavirus, we're losing control over price because in shortages, prices spike. And then we lose control really over our national sovereignty. As, as if you think about it, when we lose control over medicines, and somebody else is controlling that supply. Whoever controls that supply controls the world. You know, it's not the first time China has uh, threatened us with drug shortages. They've threatened the United States with drug shortages before. But this threat was out there very visible. The other threat was a very quiet threat. And I learned about it when I was writing China Rx. 
I mean, this is a threat to kill Americans by withholding medicines. You can't get more brazen than that. And if that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what is. If you'd like to check out that full interview, I'll throw a link to it. It'll be right there in the description box. And I really hope that you not only check it out, but also share it with your friends and family. Because again, a problem like this requires a lot of awareness in order for there to be any kind of a change. Again, the link will be right there in the description box below. And then lastly, if you haven't already, take a quick moment to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already in order to get this type of honest news content delivered directly into your YouTube feed while YouTube still allows it. Also consider hitting that notification bell so you can actually be notified of any new videos as we release them. And then lastly, if you happen to have a Telegram account, consider following us at FactsMatter underscore Roman. We'll publish the links to all of our episodes there so in case anything ever does happen here on YouTube, you can always find us on Telegram. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.